I love it when a worship experience together includes an orchestra. What a blessing. Thank you so much. What a blessing it is to be with you this Sabbath morning. If you were telling the story of Jesus, would you begin it with a barren woman? You were inspired to proclaim the Jesus story, and, and you want to include Jesus' family, his background, key people to his beginning. It's the setup for his life's work, for his ministry, for his death and resurrection. Would you begin Jesus' story with a barren woman? Luke does. In chapter 1 of his gospel, beginning in verse 5, it reads that in the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. In Jesus' day, a barren woman had no future. Would you begin Jesus' story with a barren woman? If you were telling the Jesus story, would you include widows? Luke does, lots of them beginning with Anna, in chapter 2, verse 36. There was a, also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phenuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer, night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God, and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. In Jesus' day, widows had no future. They needed to quickly remarry. Would you begin Jesus' story with a widow? My grandfather lived to be 97. Although only God knows his heart, my grandpa never seemed very sure of religious beliefs and convictions. As much as our family hoped that he would, he never became a Seventh-day Adventist. For him, hope in the future wasn't about coming back to life in an earth made new. But hope in the future meant the continuation of his name, his family's name, through sons. When his only sons only son, my brother, got married. My grandpa, then 93, got into an airplane for the very first time in his life. He crossed the United States of America because he wanted to be there for the start of a marriage that would hopefully bring him a grandson and, most importantly, a continuation of the Holoviak name. It was his only way of having a future. When my brother's son was born several years later, my grandpa was so happy. He felt that he could die in peace. My grandfather would never start Jesus' story with a barren woman. But Luke does. Luke begins with Elizabeth. And he doesn't stop surprising us there. He keeps telling stories of people without much hope in the future. And Luke especially loves stories about widows. One particular widow gives us a glimpse into Jesus' love of families, all different kinds of families. When those families who don't seem to have a future meet Jesus, something surprising happens. And they suddenly have the most amazing future of all. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 7. 
Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her, and he said to her, Do not weep. Then Jesus came forward, and he touched the stretcher, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead one sat up, and he began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us. God has looked favorably on his people. This word about Jesus spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. There was a mother in Nain who no longer had a child. He had died. He was lying on a stretcher. In Jesus' day, they didn't have caskets like we do. Her boy was gone. And her hopes for him would be buried along with the body of her dear boy. This wasn't her first funeral. She was a widow. Her boy, her only son. Without a husband and without a son, it was her funeral too. A woman couldn't survive in the first century world without a male. If a brother or brother-in-law didn't take her in, it was her funeral too. There was a mother in Nain who no longer had a child. But scripture says that when Jesus saw her, he had compassion for her and said, do not weep. Then he came forward and he touched the stretcher. You weren't supposed to touch anything connected to a dead body. But Jesus quickly, willingly touches the stretcher. And he said, young man, I say to you, rise. The dead one sat up. He began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. There was a mother in Nain, and she had her child again. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us. God has visited his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea. I bet the news spread. According to Luke's gospel, this is Jesus' first time raising someone from the dead. Jairus' daughter will be raised later, but first is a widow's son. She's a widow, and she's a mother. Notice how the story of Jesus' first family and earliest ministry is told through the stories of widows and mothers. The entire gospel of Luke begins with a woman who desperately wanted to be a mother but couldn't. In Elizabeth's day, to be barren meant to be cursed by God. But Luke shatters that idea. Luke describes Elizabeth as living according to God's will, as righteous before God, and as barren. But by the middle of chapter 1 of Luke's gospel, Elizabeth is six months pregnant, and she is overjoyed. This gospel continues with the story of an unmarried woman who is pregnant, not typically something to sing about, and yet Mary bursts into song. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, All generations will call me blessed. These two mothers-to-be spend three months together in wonder at what God can do. When baby Jesus is dedicated in the temple in Jerusalem, Scripture says that a devout believer who stayed in the temple day and night worshiping joins Jesus' family singing praises at God's goodness. 
that believer is described as a prophet named Anna, an 84-year-old woman, a widow. She sings to God in the temple. She fasts. She prays. In a way that must have surprised his readers, Luke tells Jesus' story using women's voices. Elizabeth, a, de a descendant of Aaron, a Levite, devout, keeping God's commandments, righteous, barren. And Anna, a descendant of the tribe of Asher, devout, constantly in the temple in praise to God. Both women knew heartbreak, a lifetime of disappointments. Yet both their stories end in songs of praise. There's one more woman in Jesus' story before the mother in Nain story. This, this woman is a sermon illustration that Jesus uses in his first recorded sermon. Jesus had begun his public ministry, and he, he comes to his hometown, and as he's done all of his life, he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath. He must have been asked to have the sermon because after reading from Isaiah, Jesus sits down. Now, this was typical in a synagogue service. You stood up to read scripture. You sat down to give the interpretation of scripture. Reading from the scroll, as recorded in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. After reading from the scroll, Jesus sits down and then says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The people of Nazareth love this interpretation of Isaiah. They love it. And then, reminding them of their own tradition, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. And there was a severe famine in all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. When Jesus reminds the people in his hometown about this widow, they try to kill him. Jesus reminds them of a woman, a foreign woman, a woman whose son was miraculously restored to life. But hers is a story the people in Nazareth don't want to hear. They're ready to, com to commit murder if that's what it takes to silence her story. The first four chapters of Luke tell the stories of four women. Two surprised mothers, Elizabeth and Mary, and two widows, Anna and the widow of Zarephath. And then... Then we meet a woman in Nain who is both. She is a mother and a widow. And when Jesus raises her son and gives him back to his mother, the crowd in Nain gets it in contrast with those in Nazareth. The people in Nain proclaim a great prophet has risen among us. God has visited his people. Mothers and widows help tell the story of Jesus. And there are those who embrace Jesus' story, and there are those who find Jesus' story deeply offensive. A barren woman gives birth. A virgin girl carries the Christ. An 84-year-old widow who loves to be in God's house a foreigner, a widow in Zarephath who becomes part of the sacred stories, and a widow in Nain whose story started in tears and ends in unspeakable joy. How much we owe Luke for remembering and preserving and treasuring these stories of Jesus' first family. Do we treasure them? <laughs>
Do we? In our lives, are, are we remembering the stories of barren women and young girls and 84-year-old widows? Do we treasure them like Luke did? All churches claiming to live in the tradition of Luke's gospel must treasure the stories of mothers and widows, must celebrate the voices of the Marys and the Annas. All churches claiming to live in the tradition of Luke's gospel all such churches are called to embrace families who, humanly speaking, don't seem to have much of a future, but who, with Jesus, have the most amazing future possible. If Anna had been engaged when Mary was, the typical age was between 12 and 12 and a half years of age for a girl to be betrothed. If Anna had been engaged when Mary was, then Anna had been a widow for 65 years. For 65 years, she was looking and hoping for the redemption of Jerusalem, praying for it, fasting for it, praising God for it, longing for it. Those of us who are not yet 84 have much to learn from those who have given decades of their lives looking for God's redemption. Hoping and praying and living in anticipation of God's coming back. Anna's story tells us that the one who has given a lifetime of service to God sees things that the rest of us miss. People in the temple that day saw yet another couple bringing a baby for dedication. Anna saw the Savior of the world. Anna saw that God had visited his people that day. Those who have given a lifetime of service to God see things that the rest of us miss. Scripture says, the dead one sat up and he began to speak and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them and they glorified God saying, a great prophet has risen among us. God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. It even spread to the prison where John the Baptist was being held. Placed in prison several chapters earlier, we now hear from John the Baptist for the first time since his imprisonment. He sends a question to Jesus through his disciples. It's right after the widow of Nain story. After Jesus has raised her son, two verses later, John asks, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? The question is repeated in the very next verse. Are you the one? Are you the one, Jesus, or are we to wait for another? Luke treasured the stories of mothers and widows, and Luke treasured the story of the Messiah's forerunner who doubted. A boy born to a barren woman, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John, in prison, wondered if his life's work was in vain. Prison can do that to people. Feeling trapped skews our views of things. Prison walls block our visions. Several weeks ago, I experienced a first. I am terrified of heights, I will admit to you this morning. Terrified of heights, yet I found myself with Lyle and Gaylene Heiss in a four-seater Cessna plane. It was a clear day at sunset, and our views were amazing. It seemed I couldn't open my eyes wide enough to take it all in. The Hunter Valley, north of Avondale College. And then, a few minutes later, all of Avondale College could be seen outside my window. And then Lake Macquarie and its winding shoreline, and then Sydney Harbor, one of my favorite city skylines in the world and then back. As our pilot prepared to land the plane, we looked down at Cessnock Prison, 
while my vision had expanded so much in the past 90 minutes, I saw where people are punished by having their views narrowed, diminished, limited. Prison walls block our vision. They may be prisons of our own making. They're still prisons. Feeling trapped skews our views of things, narrows what we can see, what we can even imagine. Notice what the disciples are told to do. Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The, bl the blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have the good news preached to them. Jesus uses the language of Isaiah that he had read during his sermon in Nazareth. And he tells them, tell John the good news of healing for the sick, of hope for the poor, and resurrections of children return to their mother's arms. Tell them, tell them, tell them what you've seen. Tell John the story of Jesus. And I hear Luke telling us, his most recent readers of these amazing texts, disciples, Disciples, go to those trapped in all different kinds of prisons and tell them the gospel. Tell them Luke's gospel, the treasured stories of widows and mothers, those voices who weep at funerals and sing songs and praise God as they wait for the redemption of Jerusalem. Jesus' message to John concludes, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Chapter 7, verse 23. Blessed are we when we celebrate like the town of Nain rather than the synagogue in Nazareth. Blessed are we when we take no offense at the Jesus story, a story of amazed mothers and rejoicing widows. Blessed are we. The final scene of Luke's gospel describes those who have just witnessed Jesus' ascension into heaven. They are the people who have said yes to Jesus. They are the people who believe. They are the people Jesus promises will receive the Holy Spirit and will share the gospel with the whole world. And Luke ends by describing them as people who are continually in the temple praising God. Remind you of anyone? continually in the temple praising God. Anna. Anna was day and night in the temple praising God. At the end of the Gospel of Luke, the members of the believing community have all become Anna. They do what Anna had spent a lifetime doing. The Gospel of Luke tells an amazing story. It's Jesus' story. It's a surprising story where barren women and virgins give birth, where dead sons and daughters come back to life, where widows teach us how to sing. It's a surprising story, a story that we are invited to join and to share. Go, go and tell all who are in their prisons the blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have the good news preached to them. Amen.